Black Bear Population Research in the Southern Appalachians. I'm Christy Keel Blackman. Hi, I'm Christy Keel Blackman with the Department of Forestry, Wildlife, and Fisheries at the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture. Today I have Jake Hum with me, and he is a research associate with our department, and he's also a project lead for the Southern Appalachian Cooperative Bear Study. Welcome, Jake. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me today. Why don't you start off by telling us what this project is? It has a long name, Southern Appalachian Cooperative Bear Study. What does this entail? It is a rather large, cumbersome study, (laughs) as the name implies. We are a collaborative research effort uh, put together by four different state management agencies and in partnership with various federal and private organizations. This study is a 14 million acre population estimate of the American black bear in the Southern Appalachians that spans across uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. Great. What is the data you're gathering? What is the actual data that you want to see? Well, let me start off with a little bit about the methods. We use uh, spatially explicit capture recapture to estimate population demographics, specifically abundance and density for black bear populations. And what that entails is collecting bear hair (laughs) from individuals in, in the wild and then using that hair to put together a genetic capture recapture history. Using that capture recapture history, we then use that to figure out what our capture rate is for the entire population. And we use those data also to put together a spatial distribution for the animals that we have captured and for any animals that could have been captured on our trapping grid. So we put all that data together in, into a program called uh, Spatially Explicit Capture Recapture Seeker. And then we use that to put together an estimate of abundance and an estimate of density for populations in the Southern Appalachians. So we're talking about collecting hair from an animal that is in excess of 300 pounds. How do you actually go about getting that hair <laughs> from the bears? That's a good question. So traditionally, in previous mark recapture studies, what you had to do was mark the individual somehow, which usually entailed some sort of live capture. So you'd dart an animal, either free range or in a trap, anesthetize the animal, and then put a tattoo or an ear tag or some unique identifier on the animal that allowed you to recapture it and say, we have recaptured this bear. So that obviously takes a lot more time and effort and drug certifications, and all sorts of paperwork to get that ball rolling. And what we use is a series of barbed wire hair snares, it's a passive hair collection system. The idea is two strands of barbed wire that are wrapped around a series of three to five trees with a hanging food reward in the center of the trap. And if the animal is interested enough in going to the center of the trap that they have to go across the barbed wire, sometimes the barbs will snag a little bit of hair. And we genotype the hair sample to figure out what bear has accessed what trap. So we are using a genetic marker instead of an ear tag to put together our capture history. And so is this more cost efficient and less stressful for the animal? Oh, extremely. It's very cost efficient on a large scale. That's one of the reasons why we were able to get this study off the ground. For smaller scale population studies, sometimes live capture is still a viable option. But for 14 million acre population studies where we're covering you know, the majority of the southern Appalachians, we need something that's a little more cost efficient. And barbed wire is a lot cheaper than using uh, live capture and anesthetization drugs and all that good stuff. As far as stress on the animal, yes, the the overall experience is not nearly as stressful. Live capturing an animal, obviously, you have to use drugs to anesthetize them so that they will not feel the theoretically invasive procedures that we use. You know, clipping in ear tags is, is a painful thing, so you have to use anesthesia. And recovering from those drugs can be kind of a rough process. And the bear is usually ending up in a trap. The whole thing is is much more stressful for the animal than being out in the woods alone, coming across a little bit of barbed wire and going across it. And getting a treat. And getting a treat in the process, (laughs) yes. You say this covers 14 million acres. All said and done, we're trying to cover an area that spans about 14 million acres. 
Now, part of the process of estimating the population using spatially explicit capture recapture entails putting a viable buffer zone around your trapping grid. So we use a 16 kilometer buffer around our grids. And with that included 16 kilometer buffer, the combined total area is around 14 million acres. The black bear is, of course, a symbol of our region, and mm. it's an animal that everyone, I think, has a good bit of affection and or respect for. Why is this important? Why do we need to be concerned about black bear populations? Bears are, as you, as you mentioned, an iconic species in this state and in, in the Appalachians in general. They're a great tourist attraction. I mean, the Smokies, one of the reasons why they get so much visitation is because of their bear populations. I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going to be familiar with the concept of bear jams in the Smokies, just watching large groups of people pulling over to watch Mama Bear and her cubs foraging in the springtime. It's, it's a really great thing to be able to see. Traditional hunters in the, in the Appalachians have relied heavily upon black bears as a source of food, as a source of hide for clothing, jewelry through their teeth, and today's modern hunting population still do take a lot of pleasure in the sport of hunting black bear. That's another reason why we, we actively conserve the species, because it is a viable game species. The reason that I like to harp on as far as the importance of conserving bear populations is because they make an excellent umbrella species. Bears require a lot of habitat in order to maintain viable population numbers, and if you conserve those animals, you're also conserving the habitat in which they live. And that habitat is vital to a number of different other species, especially in the southern Appalachians. So how many individual bears have you actually identified with this project? So we've actually not identified any individuals yet. Part of the genetic component of our research is actually handled by Wildlife Genetics International. They are a well-known, well-established genetics company based out of Alberta, Canada. And we collected about 4,500 individual hair samples just this season. And that's, that's our first half of the study. So we, we really don't have the resources to process all those samples ourselves, which is why we send those out to WGI. Those guys also have one of the most extensive microsatellite libraries for black bears in North America of any laboratory in the world. And their quality control process is really great. It's top notch. So we send that out to them. They genotype the samples. It generally takes anywhere between five and nine months for them to get our genetic capture history back to us, at which point we'll start our analysis. So right now, I can't tell you. <laughs> okay, that's fine. You're halfway through the project now? We are halfway through the data collection phase of the project. So we covered the eastern face of Tennessee, a large portion of the northern area of Georgia, and then basically the northwestern corner of South Carolina this year. It's all going to be North Carolina next year, but basically we have another 7 million acre chunk of the Appalachians that goes through North Carolina. That's why we split it up the way that we did, because their study area is more or less equivalent to all three other states' study areas combined. So we have one more year of data collection, and then as soon as we get back these samples from year two, that is when we'll begin our final analysis. How long do you expect the final analysis to take? Well, that depends on how much we can get done in the interim with year one's data. The analysis itself can take up to a few weeks, maybe a month or so, to run all the models that we would like to run, but we can save a lot of time trying to figure out just what kinds of habitat covariates we want to run, what kinds of sources of bias we can account for in our analysis using year one's data. One of the reasons why we were able to get this project funded is our method is suited to large-scale population research. And studies of this kind have not really been done much in the past on this scale. So each state management agency has been doing some population research in the past on local bear populations in their respective states. However, previous techniques have limited the size of the studies that they could conduct. And so with this study, we're able to make a combined effort for the entire region, as opposed to smaller populations such as in the Smokies or in Big South Fork or something like that. With this study, we can cover the entire Southern Appalachians all at once and get a snapshot of bear population demographics for the entire region. So with this methodology, is this a game changer for animal data collection moving forward? 
I would say yes. I would say it is. I mean, the, the combination of using genetic mark recapture as opposed to live capture techniques and the added advantage of clustered sampling design, which is specific to spatially explicit capture recapture, allows us to cover a much wider range than we would normally be able to with traditional mark recapture. And thus, we are able to put together large-scale population estimates that have never been done before. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Bear conservation research, once again, is really important because of the umbrella species concept. And I think any project of this scale takes a uh, collaborative effort from various agencies. And we wouldn't be able to do this without the help of the private and public agencies that have funded this project and who have allowed us access to their property in order to conduct our research. The North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and the Georgia Department of Natural Resources have provided the majority of the funding for this project, and for that we're really thankful. The Cherokee National Forest has actually provided a bit of funding as well and has allowed us access onto their property. Obviously, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, National Park Service has done a, a lot to help us out with access to trail networks and manways that we wouldn't otherwise be able to get to because we didn't know the terrain that well. Mm-hmm. They provided us with bunk housing for our technicians, and there are hundreds, literally hundreds of private landowners without the support of whom we would not be able to do this study because they have allowed us access to their land to do the research. Great. Jake, thanks so much. Once again, this is Christy Keel Blackman with the Department of Forestry, Wildlife, and Fisheries at the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture. Thanks for listening.